honor to be with you today. My name is Dr. Curtis Rimmerman, and I am a practicing cardiologist and chairman of international operations at Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic, similar to other healthcare organizations around the world, has been responding to this unprecedented COVID-19 healthcare crisis as our number one organizational priority. Like others, we continue to learn and share best practices as we are poised to begin our planning for our COVID recovery phase. We have strived from our CEO on down to maintain up-to-date and transparent communication to our greater than 65,000 caregivers. It's this communication philosophy that has energized us to plan this webinar. As Joe mentioned, I am very privileged to be joined by Dr. Steve Gordon, Chairman of Infectious Disease at Cleveland Clinic. Before I turn over the presentation to Dr. Gordon, let me share his background with you. Dr. Gordon received his medical degree from Cornell University, followed by his internal medicine internship and residency at the University of Chicago, plus a residency with the United States Public Health Service. He completed an infectious disease fellowship at Emory University and the Centers for Disease Control, both in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Gordon joined the Cleveland Clinic professional staff in 1994, and he remains a full-time clinician and has played an integral role formulating our organizational resp response to COVID-19. As far as today's webinar format, Dr. Gordon will be the primary presenter and subject matter expert. We have agreed to a set of questions interspersed throughout Dr. Gordon's presentation at which time Dr. Gordon and I will have a short dialogue. It's my hope you find this interactive format valuable. We've already received a few audience questions. I will do my best to integrate those as our time allows. Steve, thanks so much for participating. Let me turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Kurt, and uh, good morning from the States. And Joe, thank you for setting this up. Can everyone hear me okay? Is uh, volume okay? And the slides. So again, my task, as uh, Dr. Rimmerman said, is to give a little bit of a background and hopefully a little bit of insight into our response to COVID-19 um, and also that this is a ongoing learning process for us all. Um, to start, I just want to acknowledge throughout the world all the, the COVID heroes that we call them. Uh, these obviously include our patients afflicted with the infections, our providers on the front lines that are taking care of these patients, the public, which has really responded so well throughout the world, I think, and of course, the families of the providers and the patients. So again, the first component, what I'd like to do is, is give a little bit of update on the COVID-19 epidemiology. Then we'll move to preparedness uh, in meeting the demands for the clinical burden. And then, of course, the, the issue about how this is affecting us, not just as a healthcare organization, but individually, what I call kind of empathy in the era of the pandemic, and then hopefully moving toward the way forward in recovery. Um, this, to give just an example, COVID-19 is caused by a new virus. This is um, SARS-CoV-2 to distinguish it from SARS-CoV-1, which we all remember from 2003. And it truly is a newly emerging pathogen. That is one that we have not seen before. This is in contrast to other types of emerging or re-emerging diseases, such as measles that we saw last year, and unfortunately, other issues that we talk about, such as deliberately uh, emerging, uh, such as the anthrax attacks occurring in the homeland back in um, 2001. Now, I don't wanna give a huge background to disease emergence, but if you look at all these boxes, it's obviously interrelated. And probably the most common theme is human activities. Uh, as we know, this virus uh, is what we call a zoonosis. That is a disease of animals coming from bats. Uh, we still don't know how the intermediate mammal that occurred, but most likely this occurred in China and most likely associated uh, with that open air market. But as you can see, there's so many other factors, including uh, things like global warming in terms of also uh, international travel, which is a, a good diaspora in terms of how to spread. All these have come into play in this current pandemic. Now this slide is already out today, it was made a few days ago, but um, again, the estimates of cases now worldwide is 2.5 million. And we all know that's a gross underestimate uh, based upon true cases and with over now close to 200,000 deaths. The hotspots have continued to be in parts of Italy, but of course, New York City and the States is now what we call the current epicenter of transmission and also of cases. Uh, in the United States is now upward of probably a quarter of a million cases and now reaching 42,000 deaths. 
In terms of just definitions, this electromicrogram shows the kind of the protein knobs on the outside of the envelope, which do form a crown shape, hence the word corona and how this genus gets its name. Uh, this is one of seven coronaviruses that affect humans. Uh, the other four are very common causes of the cold. And again, the virus itself, as we said, is severe acute respiratory virus, coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, to distinguish it from SARS-CoV-1. Now, this curve is uh, a kind of shows a little bit of a difference in terms of the prior two coronaviruses, which caused epidemics in this, uh, in this current century. Uh, if we look at uh, the current graph, and this is again was early in the epidemic, this is really exponential growth in cases for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and you can see the time for the first 40,000 cases really uh, was relatively small. Contrast that to SARS-CoV-1, and one can see that in terms of it took about eight months to infect 8,000 people. Uh, again, the epicenter of that went from China into North America and parts of South Korea. In contrast that to the relatively small number of cases of MERS, that is the Middle, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, which uh, took about a, a 12 months to infect 108, and obviously is still prevalent in parts of Northern Africa in the kingdom. But again, this is just reflects in terms of the spread of our current virus in pandemic with very, very much uh, greater velocity and far greater reach. The other interesting thing we talk about in this current epidemic is what we call the genomic epidemiology. So as we know, the viruses can be cultured and then can be sequenced. And because it's an RNA virus, there are mutations that occur. And looking at those mutations uh, in terms of isolation of viruses, one can then kind of go back linearly and see from whence it came. And uh, this is ongoing um, and it's interesting, you know, this has got about 30,000 base pairs in its genome. And it doesn't accumulate a lot of mutations, such as what we'd say with HIV, but does accumulate about one to two mutations a month. And therefore, again, we can reveal how it spreads. So for instance, we know in the West Coast in the States that the introduction probably came from Asia, although there are multiple introductions, whereas the East Coast, it looks like the sequencing would suggest that a lot of the introductions came from Europe. Uh, again, this doesn't say anything about, um, uh, how could I say, uh, its tendency to cause more or less severe disease, and one has to be careful with the correlations. But this is something that is a little bit different in this uh, outbreak than others in terms of our molecular techniques. So now we get to the first question, Kurt. Thank you so much, Steve. So one thing that's been on my mind, and I think others, is what accounts for COVID-19 spreading so far and so fast as compared to prior viruses? So I think it's a great question. And I think for those of you that like to read, um, you know, Michael Crichton and all these pandemics, uh, you probably couldn't have designed a better situation for spread. And what we mean by that is the respiratory route uh, is obviously a very effective way to spread through humans, especially if it's upper respiratory tract, where, which this virus likes to hang out, and especially through cough or infected secretions, very similar to influenza uh, in that regard. And of course, can also be transmitted by what we'd say fomites in terms of contaminated surfaces. And as you all know, all of us, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, touch our face inadvertently and things of this nature. So this is the, uh, how can we say, a great model for spread. The other thing is, in terms of the pathogen point of view, although yes, people die from COVID-19, most people don't, and then the short incubation period allows for transmissions. One of the other things that is, becomes apparent about this virus that's a little bit different than influenza, with influenza, generally transmission can occur one day before the onset of symptoms. It's apparent that with COVID-19, that is with this virus, it's more likely two days before. And similar to influenza, the highest viral loads are early on, that is in that what we call pre-symptomatic phase or early on. And that's an effective way again for transmission uh, from person to person. Thanks very much. Let me ask another question from our audience here. Uh, we had, uh, at least in the advertisement for this webinar, we had spoken about uh, talking more specifically about communication in the healthcare organization. And one question that came in is how to communicate best across job descriptions, thinking both of the clinical and non-clinical personnel and their varying levels of medical knowledge. Yeah, I think that's another great question. And, and as we're all taught, I think we really want to make this down so that it's a simple message 
um, to uh, what we would say in the States, that fifth grade reading level in terms of this nature, and also be cognizant of also cultural differences in terms of languages and things of this nature. So what our messages have tried to focus on is, is very simple types of, situ of, of, of instructions and very simple types of, in the hospital, personal protective equipment. The caveat on this is we are in 2020, information is so quick that all of us have been somewhat reactive. In fact, we are having to react to quote unquote pre-publications, that is things that are being put online even before they're peer reviewed. And I think that makes this one much more challenging for organizations. But we, we do try to, that's a great question in terms of messaging, uh, know what you wanna say, Keep it simple, repeat that message, uh, and be sure that you're very clear about uh, what you say and what the expectations are. And to drive home that point, our CEO and the executive leadership have been in daily communication with our entire enterprise. And this demonstrates, I think, to our caregivers, one, that the leaders are engaged, two, they're aware of what's going on and how it's impacting our organization. And it allows us to share our short and medium term strategy with our caregivers as our job descriptions are completely shifted and in some instances turned upside down. Many of us are working from home. Many of us in the first time in our careers are seeing patients by phone or by video. So we're many non-clinical and clinical, we're all questioning our job description right now and it's in a state of flux. And I think that constant communication from leadership in a very transparent and timely way has been very helpful. Yeah. Uh, also, we've involved our marketing and communications department very heavily, and they, they are the experts in communication. So any of you who come from organizations where you have a marketing and communications department, I suggest highly that you rely on those experts for uh, expert communication. And they, re they really do know how to get the message out and to get it out to the right people at the right time. So why don't we uh, leave it there, Steve, and why don't you continue with your presentation, please? So one of the things that, um, that, that as a clinician uh, that we see is we talk about the clinical features. And I think it's interesting to watch how this has evolved over time. Initially, the case definition evolved around an acute lung injury. So this would have been fever, cough, malaise in terms of this. But again, as the pandemic emerged and, and we begin to see different presentations with testing, you saw evolving clinical spectrums. So this might even include, uh, for Dr. Rimmerman, things like myocarditis. This might also include things like loss of smell. Uh, there have been new presentations associated with this as well, in turn, in, including CNS events. So I'm a very humble by this uh, virus because I don't think we know the entire clinical spectrum yet. And as we do more testing, I think things will become apparent. Again, the other thing to, um, to emphasize is most people infected with COVID-19 are not gonna require hospitalization, will have mild disease. Uh, and again, we believe person-to-person -person transmission is primarily through the droplet aerosol, similar to influenza. Incubation period we talk about that is time from infection to development of symptoms is usually about five days. And again, most people who are gonna develop symptoms or signs will do so within two weeks. That is quote unquote, uh, the incubation period that we're using. The reproductive number, that is how many cases will one case beget in anything greater than one means that it will continue to kind of spread without intervention. So there, the numbers now look to be about without social distancing, somewhere above two. And again, I wanna talk about the fatalities. We obviously have seen fatalities. Uh, most of these are in patients who are obviously intubated in the ICUs. Uh, but again, this has not been even. So 80% of our fatalities in the States are people over 65, most of those with underlying conditions. This was an interesting MMWR, which was focused on children because children, fortunately, it's not that they don't get infected, but um, there's a, not a lot of kids that are being hospitalized uh, in having fatal disease, which is very, very fortunate. But if you just look at this kind of uh, fever, shortness of breath and cough for both is obviously present, much more in adults. But look at some of these other signs and symptoms, runny nose, headache, abdominal pain, diarrhea. And hence, I would say the myriad of potential presentations, which aren't always going to be uh, the classic uh, fever and cough. And as these CTs are showing, uh, lung infiltrates. Um, again, fatalities, uh, we talk about, it's not that healthy people can't get sick. And of course, we all know of some patients that were quote unquote healthy who unfortunately have died, but that is the exception. Most of the uh, severity illness and most of the deaths are associated with underlying disease. Interesting, 
A lot of this is cardiovascular, uh, it, which is probably not a surprise, but there's other associations coming up in terms of underlying smoking, as well as uh, association with obesity. This gets to what we all know across the world, what we call the social determinants of health. Uh, this data comes from Chicago, which we were just updated, uh, but it's true in other big cities such as Detroit uh, and also um, e even here in Cleveland. So if you look at, say, the people of color, they are disproportionately being affected, meaning uh, more ICU and disproportional mortality. This is probably not a biologic reason, uh, but if we think about it, uh, it is a luxury to be able to work from home, to be able to have the space to socially isolate or distance. And many people who are living with a lot of other people or who don't have those opportunities are gonna be at higher risk in society than others. And this is an active area of obviously intervention in research. I wanna to switch to treatment because a lot's been made of treatment. And initially there was this enthusiastic wave of all sorts of treatments, but, um, the infectious disease guidelines, which just came out as well as NIH and other international guidelines, uh, un underscore that the only proven treatment for COVID-19 is supportive care. Now this might be oxygen, this might be fluids, this might be uh, things like acetaminophen, and of course, uh, this also might include intensive care, proning, and ventilator use. In terms of antivirals and other medications, as you know, there was a lot of, of enthusiasm uh, about hydroxychloroquine uh, with or without azithromycin. Uh, studies are now showing, of course, there's probably more harm than good. Um, and this people are backing off of this, I think appropriately. Remdesivir was an antiviral drug developed for Ebola. There was a compassionate use trial published in the journal a couple of weeks ago, which showed an association with, with okay outcomes. But again, we're all waiting for the randomized controlled trial, which should uh, hopefully be reported by next month. In terms of vaccinations, this is probably our route to what we'd say a protection. Uh, and again, a lot of, of activity in terms of vaccines, but we don't anticipate vaccines going into the public arms until late next year. This brings us to the next interlude, Kurt. Right, thanks so much. Quota vaccine development rates seem to vary between 12 months and four years based on historical uh, information, Steve, and listening to the experts. Given the worldwide focus of uh, developing a vaccine, do you envision this being perhaps a shorter timeline than, for instance, 12 months? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think, you know, as a infectious disease person, we, we view vaccinations as obviously, uh, you know, probably the greatest public health intervention, uh, you know, going back since Jenner. But vaccines are very tricky too. So you have to remember that there's never been a respiratory virus vaccine in Corona uh, that's been developed uh, before. They got pretty far with SARS until SARS fell off. So there is a platform and the platform that many are using have to do with an adenovirus vector, adenovirus 26. So using this, which actually uh, um, is, is a, it can be a pathogen of humans, although not the 26, and then inserting a certain piece of DNA, which will code for hopefully an antigen that is protective against coronavirus. This has gone fairly far and fairly quick. You've got big pharma as well as obviously government supporting this. You've also got monkey models now and, and good hard metrics for protection. And more importantly, with this model, you also have scalability. So the ability, um, if hitting successful targets and safety targets, to really uh, amplify this up to potentially a billion doses um, and so scalability is, is important. Safety is obviously very important. And then obviously the basic science is important. So um, we've seen a lot of what I call crowdsourcing. Most of the big pharma producing this is not doing this for profit, uh, um, which I think is a great thing. Uh, and the way I'm looking at COVID-19 now is in the pre-vaccine era versus the post-vaccine era in terms of protection versus not protection, which we'll talk about, we'll have a lot of translation in terms of how we recover. So any prognostication in terms of when you think a vaccine might be available or just an, an impossible question at this point? Yeah, so I think um, the phase one trials, as we said, are ongoing. I think uh, the next big round will be probably early in the fall in terms of phase two. Uh, if they hit those targets, then I would imagine you're gonna see wrapping up in terms of phase three trials and again, I would anticipate um, if those are successful, that it will start reaching the public arms, uh, hopefully before next, uh, the flu season in, in 2021. Okay, well, thank you. And then another question that came to my mind, why do symptoms vary so widely amongst patients? 
you know. So that's a great question too, Kurt. I think part of this is, is the clinical spectrum. We were all focused on uh, respiratory symptoms up front. Um, one thing about a pandemic is it uh, allows you then to kind of broaden your scope a little bit and look for other associations, especially as testing is there. The other thing to remember, and this gets back to spread, is because this is a new virus, a new pathogen, we don't have any pre-existing immunity. Um, and so you're really hitting what we'd say a very naive human population. And so with biology, we, we would expect a, a variety of presentations, just like we see with other respiratory viruses. Thank you. I just have a couple questions online. I want to acknowledge our audience real quickly. What is the risk of aerosol transmission of COVID during robotic surgery? Yeah, so I think the issue about aerosolization, aer aerosol transmission are, are very different. All respiratory viruses can quote unquote be aerosolized, but I really do believe that COVID-19 is behaving as droplet contact not what we'd say aerosolized transmission that we think about with measles, that we think about with tuberculosis. For all of our surgeries now, um, again, because of the airway, uh, people are considering that now and a potential aerosolized generating procedure. So N95 respirators are being used by our anesthesiologists. But again, I think it really depends, quite frankly, for robotic surgery, which organ you're, you're, you're kind of dealing with. In, at the clinic, we've assumed our, from our ENTs that anything going into the upper respiratory tract, ENT surgery, is percent, potentially aerosolized generating. Things like going into tissue, bone, and things of this nature would not be considered to be aerosolized generating for COVID-19. Thank you very much. And one last question. There was a question about interferon treatment. Is there any impact on the virus with your interferon? Any correlations with patient outcomes? Yeah, to, to my knowledge, the answer to that is no. Interferon, as we know, is our body's kind of antiviral response, uh, you know, cytokine, and that's been used uh, non-specifically for a lot of, of antiviral treatments. But all of you with experience with interferon knows it also causes a lot of shaking and baking. Uh, there's a lot of physiologic response to that. Uh, so uh, there have been no randomized controlled trials with interferon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, convalescent plasma, which is, you know, probably the new shiny penny people are talking about later in the lecture. All right, in the, in the interest of time, let's proceed, Steve, thanks. Okay, um, this is just to highlight the guidelines. And again, I, the way that I would summarize them are primum non nocere. So um, we are all supportive about science, but we really believe that for many of these um, uh, interventions, they should be in clinical trials so we can get some answers about what works and what doesn't work. I, I do wanna highlight these guidelines, uh, again, by my society, the Infectious Disease Society of America, and one of my clinical partners here at the clinic, was our Darsh Bimraj was first author on this. This is a um, German study, which is also uh, supportive of this, supportive care, their outcomes in COVID ARDS were very similar to non-COVID ARDS. Again, highlighting it's for critical care. It's important to have good critical care in this disease. Let's move a little bit to preparedness. And again, I think uh, for all organizations, no matter what you're facing, the basic concepts of preparedness and communication is a continuous process as was brought up in the earlier questions. So we define this uh, to any event, what is our capacity as, a, as an organization or society or an individual to react, to respond and to recover? Most of us have adopted what we call the incident command model and at the clinic, uh, our incident commander, Bob Wiley, we activated early in January, which I think was very important uh, in terms of a socialization event and also in terms of organization for how we responded. And then as was pointed out earlier by Dr. Rimmerman in the questionnaire, you wanna be proactive in your communication. Uh, admittedly, a lot of times I've felt, or you, know, you felt you're reacting, especially in the, the Twitter environment. But again, um, we always say the press is like a hungry bear. And if you don't feed it, it will, it will feed itself. So you really want to, uh, as was pointed out earlier, communication and what you're communicating the messages to, is very, very important. Um, just a little bit about our incident management team. Uh, early on before, quote unquote, we recognized uh, that it was in the homeland, drills, tabletop exercise. I learned a ton about supply chain review. Um, again, most healthcare in America is kind of in a just-in-time situation in terms of occupancy, in terms of our, our supplies. And so this was really something that I think all organizations are struggling with and struggling with. Education and retraining. This gets to, again, your workforce, which is your most important asset in terms of as we were preparing for a possible surge. 
And again, back to the communication, we had a one-stop intranet toolkit, which was a living document so that anyone anywhere can quickly with one click try to get some uh, up-to-date answers. Uh, and again, uh, anticipating potential search capacities for treatment, which would have included ventilators, profofol, and things of this nature. Um, this is an example. I think obviously everyone has their own intranet, but now it's front page for all of our providers, uh, still actively updated, uh, which obviously uh, is extremely important for all of us as we move forward. Um, the other thing is, I think, and this comes to all of you with the business background from Deming, you know, you really can't manage what you can't measure. And this, as we're moving toward what we call recovery, is now top and center. So again, we all know that there were some issues in the states with um, the CDC test, and we don't try to look back. Uh, that will be the postmortem. We also learned, if you look at South Korea, very quick to stand up testing. We both had the first case at the same date, but they got to 350,000 tests where we were still at 200 within the first four weeks. Um, we're talking now about home testing or self-administered tests. Actually, if you go online now, uh, there is an FDA product in the states uh, that you can do that. And then again, if you look at the Emirates, some airlines are actually requiring but providing testing before embarking. So this to me is, is the next step. It's not the only piece of recovery, but it's very, very critical. Don't wanna go through all our processes, but again, you want a menu of testing uh, in terms of for the hospital, but also for the public. And again, as we talked about management and measuring, so there is an, a nice CEO dashboard of our COVID, what we would say, um, disease burden. At one point, we actually were responsible for 30% of the testing in Ohio, which doesn't mean that we were doing too much testing. It just uh, emphasizes the fact not enough testing going on in the states. Uh, discharge patients and, of course, keeping track of our caregivers uh, with COVID-19. This is a snapshot to show, you know, if I would have looked a month ago at all of our, our hospitals, how many people had a COVID test, it probably would have been 1%. Last week when we did that survey, you can see over half the patients in our hospitals now have had a COVID test, not COVID positive. And I think as we're moving forward in the testing process in terms of recovery, this will probably reach universal testing. Many of you might have seen the report out of Columbia where they tested all their people coming in to deliver babies and found 13% of the positives were quote unquote asymptomatic. Again, emphasizing the movement now towards uh, testing almost of all inpatients in emergency department admissions. This leads so, us to the next. I think we're hearing a lot about testing, tracking, and tracing. Uh, and every, all the experts I hear say this is integral for recovery. Do you agree with that? And also, if there is a second surge in the fall, how, how is this integrated with that? So the, it's a great question. I think um, all of us would agree that um, as people begin to move forward, one of the things that are gonna help build confidence is the ability to be able to test um, workers or anybody that feels like they may have symptoms because it's kind of like saying, oh my God, we got COVID in the factory, that could actually shut things down. So access to testing is extremely important. But as pointed out, it's just not the testing. We also need a test management strategy. So that means if somebody, let's say I am positive, aside from obviously going home, how am I going to be managed in my house? The other household members there to be sure they're instructed in appropriate quarantine. Myself to make sure that I can stay isolated. That is to say that my family's taken care of, that I get food in terms of this nature. So it becomes more of a social kind of construct, something that is different for, for places like the United States. And then again, using the, this data to kind of swarm in and, and again, until we get the vaccine, to do what we'd say, enhance social distancing to prevent spread. Very complicated on one angle, but again, testing is necessary, but not sufficient if we're gonna move forward with this. Thank you, and one other question from the audience, which I think is uh, very uh, applicable here. Have you adapted the traditional incident command model to sustain on a more long-term basis? So another great question, you know, incident command, as you know, is, is set up to react to a, a, a certain situation. We are now moving towards actually standing down the incident command this week and changing some of the things into operations because now I think all of us have moved from responding to COVID, reacting to COVID, to now what I would say living with COVID. And that's a different operational model 
And so um, appropriately, I think we're in the next kind of the phase two now, standing down the incident command and driving some of these new, what we would say, um, pathways for opening up in the era of COVID, realizing that we're going to be living with COVID uh, most likely uh, for the next 18 months or so. And last question at this point, what have been the barriers in the U.S. to testing more people? Is it a matter, matter of reagent availability? So I think that's a great question. It, you know, um, there was just a nice document released by the Rockefeller Institute yesterday that I perused, and they talked about the same supply chain issues. Um, so the companies that produce these products, uh, the Roche, the Abbott's, and things of this nature, obviously have a certain amount of capacity, and it's the same supply chain issue. So some of that now is being directed to help them build more machines quickly uh, and looking at it as a, as a supply chain issue, as well as driving new technologies. And also the report mentioned is diverting some of our techniques for nucleic amplification testing to COVID testing away from potentially other things that we're using it for. So again, becomes very complex, but it all goes back to supply chain. And in this article, interesting, Currently, the United States is testing a million, a, um, million tests a week. Um, they believe we need to get up to 30 million a week. Um, and so that's going to take a little bit of time if we really want to, what we'd say, hunt COVID as opposed to having it chase us. All right. Why don't we continue, Steve? Thanks. Okay. So this gets to transmission. Uh, this uh, graphic picture of somebody sneezing shows this plume of droplet and aerosol. Um, but again... Uh, we consider the epidemiology and the status would suggest that COVID-19 is being transmitted like other respiratory viruses in terms of droplet transmission. Short incubation period, yes, there are likely what we'd say super spreader events where an individual may be able to, to spread to multiple people because of certain situations. But again, it's not behaving like the airborne viruses where you see 95% of people in contact infected, such as that are immune, uh, not immune rather, like chickenpox and measles. So if we look at household transmission studies, again, if there's a case of chickenpox in the house with, with no one else vaccinated or protected, 85% of household other contacts will get it. If we look at COVID-19 in the United States, these were travelers coming back from Wuhan, developed it. If they looked at their household, only 10 to 15% developed subsequent COVID-19 uh, from these index cases, similar to what we see with uh, influenza A. If you go to community though, so this is out of the household, this was a telling story of, of a case in Chicago. So one symptomatic patient, he was uh, sick, but not he never went to the hospital, so never that sick. He subsequently was tracked and traced to 16 proven and probable cases, including three deaths. This was close contact over an extended period of time. Uh, unfortunately, this also involved family members. This was two family gatherings, which included a birthday party and a funeral, as well as attendance at church. So this highlights to me the importance of the track and tracing. Even though this patient never went to the hospital, you can see the number of secondary cases and tertiary cases that were attributed to him because he was not isolated and not, and not diagnosed and not tested until all this was over. Um, what about the hospital? Because we hear a lot about uh, worker safety, which is top of our mind. So CDC uh, probably last week reported the U.S. healthcare worker experience uh, in terms of, 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 of how many healthcare workers in the states, which was about 9,000. But there's been very few reports of transmission in healthcare workers. And this was one of them. So this was centered around that first cases in Seattle. And before the patients were transferred to the second hospital, they did not have a diagnosis. And they looked at the healthcare workers that took care of these patients. And they identified three healthcare workers that actually developed COVID-19. And the association here was time in the room spent, again, without any um, uh, protection, but also in the presence of aerosolized generating procedures. This included um, obviously nebulization treatments. So this is why, again, uh, we believe that it is uh, aerosolized generating procedures put patients, put healthcare workers at highest risk without the personal protective equipment. Uh, this again shows the United States healthcare workers uh, with COVID-19 that were reported to CDC in the dark blue. It tracks the community cases that were reported in the United States. Um, and again, you can see the median age, 42, 
Most were women because many of these obviously are nurses in terms of this nature. Uh, and it's hard to dissect again, you know, did they acquire it in the hospital or in a community? But most of the data would suggest the biggest risk until social distancing is in the community. This gets us to, to kind of um, what we like to now say the three S's when we talk about preparation. And uh, this was nicely put and has been used, uh, space, staff, and stuff. So these are the buckets now whenever projects are put up. And again, uh, for space, we really were concerned about the need for ventilations first, the sickest patients. As a physician, the last thing we want is that moral dilemma of deciding who's gonna be put on a ventilator and who's not. Staff, this is obviously uh, our, our greatest asset in terms of our intensivists, but also redeploying in, in uh, other things like orthopedic surgeons to, to make them a part of these teams, uh, not to make them intensivist overnight, but again, in this pyramid model with supervision, we can all become learners. And I think that was important. And of course, focusing on the stuff, the ventilators, the personal protective equipment uh, and things like sedation equipment. Education, we all love to learn, and, and this has been a learning process. And then again, uh, uh, also starting some registries, research, communication, as we talked about, and also recognizing about um, staff uh, wellness in terms of how this affects people. This is an example of, of our ICUs, which probably mirror others. A lot of innovations, you can see the dialysis machine is out of the room, the IVs are out of the room, the ventilator is actually also uh, out of the room, uh, and this is to minimize the potential contact of risk of healthcare providers with these patients. The beautiful thing is, is that it's kind of machine learning. What was done in one ICU in our system was quickly adopted by others. The other thing is when we round with the ICU teams as ID, we actually can round remotely. The camera's on the patient. We're also phoned in with other consultants. And so we're moving with our intensivist. Uh, so a lot of team-based, different ways of, of, of delivering care, but actually very innovative. The stuff becomes important. Uh, you need to be sure, obviously, that your healthcare providers feel protected, that they get adequate protection. Uh, and the critical stuff, obviously, in terms of PPE, face mask, and isolation gowns. Uh, and this creates innovation. Uh, one of the big innovations, uh, as we all know, is what we call recycling uh, the face mask and the N95s. Bechtel, which is an international company centered in Ohio, you can see using uh, what we would say high-level disinfection. Uh, is able to reprocess now our face mask up to 20 times. Uh, here you can see them hanging like a clothes hanger. Uh, this is to make sure that the, um, that the disinfection is able to get to all the surfaces. Uh, the other thing we learned is there is a rejection rate because if the mask are beat up or torn, but also if there's makeup or lipstick, that's another reason for rejection. So that's another reason why we're educating uh, both men and, you know, it's, it's, we don't, we don't discriminate there, is to try to not use uh, makeup in terms of uh, when you're using your N95. And finally, um, that surge hospitals. Uh, so this has been interesting. We always want to plan for the worst, uh, hope for the best. Uh, this is our surge hospital, which is our new medical education building. The first floor has been reformatted. Although no patients have been in there, uh, this can, is ready to now handle a, a surge of patients if needed. Um, I want to pivot now to universal masking. So before COVID-19, the CDC was not a proponent of, of using masking uh, in terms of healthy people. They have pivoted on this. And I think this is something that's very important because I think moving forward, this is a non-pharmacal intervention that will be very, very important. And the reason for this, I, I think, um, is twofold. Um, if you look at the data here, and again, this is uh, the issue about the trajectories of coronavirus in countries where what we would say cloth masking in public was not uh, a big uh, proponent versus those that are. And this is mostly Asian countries, including Japan. Uh, there's a big difference in terms of the projection rates. For many countries like Japan, this has been a part of their culture for flu season. It's part of what we would call enhanced respiratory protection, hand hygiene, taking the shoes off before going to the house and wearing a mask. This includes children as well as adults. Um, and again, this is really altruistic in some ways. If you think about it, that sneeze, that is now gonna be, a lot of those particles will be protected or my cough uh, from, from being distributed out to others, not just our patients, but also obviously our colleagues. Uh, this is my better half with her home sewn mask. Uh, obviously we've got cloth masks now. It's not just for the, uh, to help us with social distancing. It also prevents us from touching our face. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, this, is, this is a good thing for both patients uh, as well as caregivers. And uh, another interesting note, we have a strong Amish community uh, and they made, uh, produced very rapidly, I think over 100,000 masks uh, for our healthcare providers and our patients. Again, it's not personal protective equipment. It's not a panacea. We want to continue to use hand hygiene as well as cough etiquette. But this is the playbook moving forward as we still go through COVID, but also into influenza respiratory season in the fall. All right. So let me go off script here and read a question from the audience, if you don't mind, Steve. Sure. Can you comment on false negative PCR testing rates, relationship of this to time of illness, and the likelihood of good antibody testing and the problems producing these? Okay, so those are all great questions and unpacking. So I think we talk a lot about, um, you know, the test sensitivity and specificity. As clinicians, we don't think about sensitivity and specificity. We think about predictive value positive and ne negative predictive value, meaning what is the likelihood if it's a positive test that the person actually has the condition, and if it's a negative test that they don't have that condition. A lot of this depends on the prevalence, that is the amount of disease you're testing in the population. So when we look at our different test strategy, our, our capacities, it is true, for instance, our PCR-based based technology is much more sensitive um, than non-PCR-based technology, such as the Abbott test, which is the 10-minute test. But remember is that all our PCR technology has at least two targets that it's going after. Um, so they are very sensitive tests in this regard. The Abbott, on the other hand, is not as sensitive. Uh, on the other hand, you get a quick result. But the negative predictive value of the Abbott is still very valuable. So I think we look at testing in terms of the, uh, in terms of the sequencing. So as a infection preventionist, I would not necessarily want to take somebody or determine isolation based on the Abbott test. But as a clinician in the outpatient, I'm very comfortable using the Abbott test if that's negative uh, to likely say the patient does not necessarily have COVID-19 and it's not gonna change my interaction. So I think testing uh, is gonna continue to evolve in this regard. We're also gonna see, I think, self-administered testing. Uh, but again, I, I think we have to be, I'd rather have a test than no test in that regard. And, and that's where things are moving. The antibody test, I think, is a different story. Uh, I will emphasize that, but it's safe to say uh, that for the RNA viruses such as COVID-19, as opposed to DNA like hepatitis B, we have never had a, a test, a serologic test that is valid for individual immunity. It is much more useful to determine population exposure. And so we need to distinguish the two. I know that it's been seen, let me get a point of care test to determine whether I'm immune or not. That is not gonna happen. Uh, it's not gonna happen in the near future. On the other hand, we're beginning to see seroprevalence surveys done across the world. The most recent one reported from California yesterday, which showed that probably between one and 2% of the population have been exposed to COVID-19. That's different than being immune. That's probably 30 times the number of cases reported, which is probably not a surprise, but this is on the level of influenza. So I just wanna make that clear. I would not bank on immunity to a point of care individual test. I would bank on serial prevalence surveys to in, in to to tell me how how much of the population has been exposed. With that being said, Steve, if a patient has confirmed COVID, uh, ultimately recovers in a very satisfactory manner, can they be considered immune and can they re-engage in normal social activities and return to work? So that's a, that's another great question. The answer to that I would say is is absolutely yes. Uh, you know, you know, there might be some exceptions for the very immunosuppressed, but this would act like any other respiratory virus or, or COVID. And generally, what we're saying is, um, 28 days uh, after your positive test, we don't we don't want any more test of cures or, or any other testing in this regard. Um, you know, we don't need that. That you're you know you're safe to go back. Uh, and interact, and you are going to be protected from this strain of, of, of coronavirus too. The other, the other thing is about healthcare workers. So uh, this gets a little into the weeds, but we have tested our healthcare workers to go back to work, and this data will will submit. But basically, um, what we will still see is low positives um, even after. The, the healthcare worker as well after 14 days, even 21 days, when we reversed it and looked at the amount of virus there, it's exceptionally small. Uh, we're talking thousands of orders of magnitude less than initially, and we correlate that with contagiousness and infectious, infectiousness. And that's why we have 
adopted the non-test-based strategy, a modification of CDC for our healthcare workers, which is essentially 10-3-2, meaning 10 days after uh, initial uh, onset of symptoms, three days making sure that you're no longer fever off any antipyretics, and then we'll allow you to come back to work and two weeks of the cloth mask. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Joe, how are we doing on time? Uh, actually, we're we're at about time, so maybe we could uh, we could close out and uh, answer answer a couple questions, Dr. Gordon, Dr. Riverman. Yeah. So so if I can, I'll just end on the the leadership aspect of 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 this. You know, this is by Stanley McChrystal, who came to who came to the clinic a couple of years ago, and I think this is what our leadership wants to do and has done. And I think some of these tips are are very important. So uh, as Dr. Rimmerman said, don't hunker down, be present, not only through uh, emails, but also um, visiting the troops. And if you look at Dr. Mahalovich, you'll see videos of him up in the COVID units, up in uh, on the floors. Uh, and so a very physical presence, which is important. The second lesson I think is demonstrate candor. So be, be humble with this. Uh, you know, we'll, we've, we'll make mistakes and admit that and continue to move on. Uh, admit to know what we don't know, which is a lot, but learn from our failures and our mistakes. Um, again, you can see this come up in almost every slide, fast, transparent, transparent and inclusive communications, directing your message to your target audience. Uh, so don't speak about, you know, necessarily cycle thresholds or viral loads when you're talking to your EVS people. Make sure that the message you want to receive uh, is, is at, at the level of the people receiving it. And finally, I think, and this is something too, is be more compassionate than you think you need to be. Um, and, and this is what I call that empathy. All of us can feel stressed and ourselves sometimes. Uh, take your own internal temperature, your own pulse, so to speak, uh, and be sure that you're refreshing yourself uh, and also kind of uh, relaxing when possible. And again, I think the other lesson, uh, and everyone has seen this slide before, is you know, there are a lot of things that matter. There's a lot of things we can control. And what we're always trying to do is find that intersection uh, and this is what our focus is on, at least today, as we move forward. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll be quiet, Kurt, and try to take <laughs> any questions. Uh, outstanding, Steve. Thanks so much. Uh, unfortunately, we've run against the uh, time limit for our webinar today. I really, really sincerely appreciate all of you who have joined. I get a list or the number of participants, and we've been completely steady. No one really has fallen off since this uh, webinar began, so I really thank you for your commitment over the past 45 minutes or so. We will be hosting our next Global Connect in the next couple of weeks. And we'd love to hear from you, our domestic and international partners, if you have ideas in terms of topics. Our job is to educate uh, around the world and share what we're doing in a very transparent manner. And if we can learn from you and you can learn from us, we'll all do better in this fight against COVID-19. We do have a short survey that, you'd that you will receive and for us to achieve our optimal outcome as it pertains to this, these objectives, I'd really, really appreciate you filling that out. Again, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and uh, all the best.